as Apostle Paul said, there's nothing good that lives inside of me. So if there's anything good, it's from Christ. Um, really excited to be here with you, with you guys tonight and um, share from the Word of God. For some reason, my voice seems to be going. I don't know why. So if there's any mistakes, any awkward moments, I apologize in advance. And um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, just want to share with you guys tonight a word that God has put on my heart, a, a word that's um, really important to me. You know, I've been preaching the word for about five years since I became a Christian. And there's been all different type of sermons. There's some sermons, you know, that I think about now, you know, and I just hang my head in shame. I'm just thinking as if I actually said that, as if that actually came out of my mouth. But these, uh, I mean, for me personally, this sermon that I'm about to share with you guys tonight, it's um, probably my most favorite and cherished sermon that God has placed in my, on my heart and given me. And it's personally a sermon that's encouraged me, especially when I was going through a tough time, as maybe some of you were aware about uh, a short time ago, I was going through a bit, a bit of a difficult time in our church. And um, it's interesting how God used His Word to encourage me, how God taught me during that time to um, place my faith and trust in the Word of God, not in my emotions, not in what other people think and what other, what other people care about, but that I would actually come to the Word for healing, that I would come to the Word for strength, and that I would come to the Word for you know, joy and peace. Um, I remember John Wesley, in one of his books, he wrote about an encounter he had uh, with a rich man, with a really rich man, and, they were, and this rich man showed him his plantation, you know, field after field. And as John Wesley was traveling, you know, on horse with this rich man, this rich man was showing, this is mine, and this is mine, and this belongs to me. And um, he asked John Wesley, well, what do you think about all of this? What do you think about all of this? And... John Wesley, you know, after a thoughtful pause goes, I think it's going to be hard for you to leave this all behind. And it's really interesting that God uses situations in our lives, uses events, circumstances to teach us not to put our hope, you know, in things that are here of this earth, not into buildings, not into, you know, even sometimes the Bible says, you know, curses the man that relies upon man. Because people always let us down, but when we put our trust in God. Now, I just want to share with you guys before I get into the Word about an um, about encounter with God that I had um, a couple of weeks ago, you know, when I was in my prayer closet. And it was just, it was a really interesting moment that I want to share with you guys. I remember I got into my room and I was just praying and I was just, you know, I was just confessing my sin you know, I had noticed a couple of sins that, that were in my life and I was confessing them to God. And, you know, it was a blessed prayer meeting where I truly, genuinely hated that sin that was, was in my life. And I was confessing that. I was um, telling the Lord that I don't want to do this anymore, that, you know, I want the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ in my life. And something very interesting happened to me at that moment, which had never happened to me to, all, to this day. When... Um, all of a sudden, this great fear just fell upon me. And it was as if just, um, there's a song that we sing, I don't know if you guys sing, it's called um, The Comforter Has Come. It's an old hymn. And there's this one word where he says that I, a child of hell, should be spared. And all of a sudden, at this moment, when I'm confessing my sin, when I'm confessing, you know, my iniquities and my... You know, my lack of perfection, my lack of fulfillment of God's will and God's word. All of a sudden, it was as if God had opened my eyes and I finally understood at that moment, finally understood to the very depths of my soul that I was a child of hell. Yes, I understood I had sinned against God. I understood I had sinned in God in so many ways. There was nothing good in me. But it was, it was such a revelation, you know, of God in that prayer that I was frightened. That I was in fear, you know, I was down there on my knees and I'm, you know, I'm trembling. I'm thinking that I'm a child of hell because of my sins, because of my love towards sin, because of my hatred towards God. And then at the very next moment, the very next moment, all of a sudden, you know, just the Holy Spirit just impressed upon my heart, you know, the forgiveness of Christ, the justification through Jesus Christ, the righteousness, which is Jesus Christ, and the great joy that comes that I, a child of hell, have escaped that. That I, a child, a child of hell, have escaped that. Dear friends, I, you know, I think it was such a, 
such an immense revelation because it was through a moment in time, you know, when I was getting caught up with the things of the world. I was getting caught up with work. I was getting caught up with different circumstances and situations, you know, and there's problems here and there's problems there. And it was at that moment when God decided to reveal to me that I am a child of hell. And if it wasn't for His grace, if it wasn't for His mercy, I would be in hell, dear friends. So I ask that the Holy Spirit would impress that upon our hearts that we, every single one of us here, would understand that we, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, would be lost, would be barren, and we would perish. Uh, the title of this sermon that I have titled, it's called, Our God is a Saving God. And I would like us to open up to Luke chapter 15. Whoever's got their Bibles and today I'm going to be concentrating a little bit. I won't be able to, and I don't have the capability to um, expound and explain the parable of the, parable of the uh, prodigal son. Uh, it's just so deep, you know, I hear so many different sermons on so many different parables and every single sermon offers something new, offers something insightful, uh, something different. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the Word of God is that we read it and something always opens and is revealed to us. And just before I get into the, about the parable of the prodigal son, I would like to have a quick look quickly at the context. The context. And the context is this, where in chapter 14, where Jesus Christ just gives before that a parable about the Great Supper, where a king or a lord, he calls... A lot of people to this supper, and it's the, in other um, Gospels it talks about it was a supper for his son. And how these servants go and invite different, all these people that are called to this supper, to this dinner. And one says, you know, I bought a whole bunch of oxen, I can't come. And then um, another says, you know, I just bought a house, I can't come. Another says, I just got married and, you know, I can't come. And he says that, you know, the master or the Lord, he got so angry... He said that none of those that were called, none of those that were invited will come to this great supper. And then he goes that go out on the streets, collect all the lame, collect all the poor, collect all the wretched, collect all the, that are crippled, you know, that are blind. Go and collect them and they will fill. And the Bible says that they came to this great supper and they filled the places. Then Jesus Christ talks about in chapter 15, when the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near to him, or the Pharisees, they started saying, you know, that he's, you know, receives company with them, that he's eating with them, that he's spending fellowship with sinners and, you know, with the most despicable outcasts, the lowest of the low. And so Jesus Christ speaks three parables in reference to these comments that the Pharisees are saying. And the first parable that he says to them, he's talking about, you know, the hundred coins, about the hundred sheep. Where this one man loses a hundred sheep, loses one of the hundred sheep. And he goes and he searches the wilderness and he searches very carefully until he finds that lost sheep. And the Bible says that when he finds that sheep, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing and he call, goes home and he calls all his friends together. And they have, you know, so to speak in our terms and language, a party or um, a dinner with all his friends. And he says, rejoice with me because I found my sheep. And then further on, Jesus Christ says that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents more than 99 who have need of no repentance. Then the second parable that Jesus Christ brings is about the ten silver coins and the woman and how she's in this place, in this house, and she loses this one coin and after she loses her coin, she lights a lamp, she starts sweeping out the whole house, starts searching the whole thing. And when she finally finds that coin, she again invites her friends. Again, she invites all those that are close to her. And she, you know, she shares that great joy she has with her friends. She rejoices about that lost coin. And he says here, rejoice with me, for I have found the lost piece which I have lost. Like as I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then, and then we see here the parable of the lost son where he talks about the lost son that leaves. And I like to read from verse 11. And then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. 
So he divided to them his livelihood. And on many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and then wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there, arose a severe famine in the land, and he, begin, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, and when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hands and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill him and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. And dear friends, what we see here is another parable that Jesus Christ gave in response to the Pharisees complaining and to what the scribes were saying. Before, I would like to draw our attention to a couple of thoughts in this passage. I'd like to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, and as through God we're pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What Apostle Peter here was saying to the Corinthian church. He's talking about that God of his own initiation. That God of himself. Not of anything you or I have done. Not of any help towards him. That God of himself has reconciled man to himself. There wasn't some sort of counsel in heaven, you know, where the angels gave him advice on, you know, what's better and what's to do. There wasn't, you know, where you and me, where our deeds were in a certain way that were pleasing or appropriate to God, where God can say, I'll save them in the future. But he says here that God has reconciled us to himself and it was his own initiation. That God was himself was reconciling, was reconciling us to himself, not imputing the trespasses. And then he says that God has not only reconciled us to himself, but he's also given us a ministry of reconciliation. But not only has He given us a ministry of reconciliation, He's given us the word of reconciliation. So what we just read in the, what we just heard in the parables from chapter 15, where it talks about this great joy that God has when a sinner repents. That God's desire, God's passion, you know, God's in the business, if I can say it, put it that way. God's in the business of saving people. You know, of reconciling man to himself. That is God's passion. That is God's desire. That is God's aim through Jesus Christ is to reconcile man to God. And the Bible talks about here and Jesus Christ brings, you know, these examples in uh, chapter 15 about those coins and about those sheep and about the prodigal son. About the great immense joy God has when a sinner is reconciled to him. About that great joy, you know, that God shares with everyone because we realize that Jesus Christ is portraying God the Father. God, Jesus Christ is portraying God as the one who has that great immense joy. And today I want to share with us that God the Father, Jesus Christ, they have great joy when a sinner is reconciled to, to God. God has great joy that you are reconciled to Him. God has great delight. God's in the business of making man at peace with him. And the first aim that God does with a human soul, and what so many churches have got wrong, they preach healing. They preach so many different things, you know, you know, I can give you joy and peace and comfort. 
But the first thing that God wants to do with a person's soul is not make his, you know, put springs on his wagon. And not to make his ride here on earth more comfortable. And God's desire is not to make the person, you know, well and strong. But his first and uttermost desire and passion is to reconcile that person with himself. Because the Bible says all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have seen there is none righteous, there is none that do good. And God's desire and God's passion and the very thing that God give, gives God the greatest joy, the greatest delight is when a person comes to God and repents, puts his faith in Jesus Christ and the atoning work of Christ upon the cross. And the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices. All of heaven rejoices. You know, what a wonderful thought it is. I believe that many of us are saved here. And what a wonderful thought it is, you know, that God was rejoicing when I came to Him. That time when I was broken, when I was so ashamed of my actions, when I was so ashamed of the filth and the black filth of my soul, God was rejoicing in heaven. Because God's in the business of reconciling man to Himself. God's desire is to save man, to save souls. We read in 2 Peter 3 verse 9. Second Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And here Peter addressing... You know, the, the people of God, he's saying that God is, you know, what well, some people are saying, you know, that, you know, Christ isn't going to come. He's taking his time. He's tarrying. And some people even said, you know, that the promise had already been fulfilled. And Peter here is saying, you know, that God hasn't come yet because he's willing that none should perish and that all should come to repentance. That God endures endless blasphemies against his name. That he endures all this rebellion and murder. Endures all, you know, all these terrible things that we see around us. Because he wants man to be saved. He wants to see man reconciled to himself. You know, we had not long ago a brother from America with us. And he was sharing how he was watching a video on YouTube. How there was a video in a Muslim country where Muslims had um, caught some Christians. And they were burning them. And how these Christians were you trying to get out the fire because, you know, it's agony, it's pain. And these Muslims were just throwing them back in there and they had all this glee. And this brother was sharing how as if when he was watching this video, tears were streaming down his face and he was going, God, I can't bear anymore that you would come and your judgment would come upon them. That you righteously would judge them for what they are doing, which is wickedness. And God seeing this, seeing the wickedness of man, seeing the depravity of man, the depravity of actions, including our own, is long-suffering, is enduring, is not slack concerning His promises, but is enduring, waiting, you know, and working in man that they should come to repentance. We'll return back to the parable of the prodigal son. And it says here, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with a prodigal living. When Jesus Christ was giving this parable, to the Pharisees and the scribes, and especially in the context of the Mediterranean or the, the, that Jewish culture, there were three shock, three shock factors, if I can explain them, in this parable that Jesus Christ spoke about the lost son. The first is the behavior, the insolent behavior of the son towards the father. What essentially what the son was saying to the father is he was going, I want you to die. Because inheritance was given when a father had died and passed away. And then two-thirds of the inheritance would go to the oldest son. And the other portions of the inheritance would go to the other sons. And obviously what we see here, Jesus Christ is showing the shock fact of the insolence. Of the depravity of the younger son where he's saying, you go, I want you to die, Dad. I don't want you to more live. I want to have what belongs to me. The second shock factor is the behavior of the dad. 
that the actual dad agreed, that the actual dad, you know, didn't put a stop to this, but actually split his livelihood. And the third shock factor is the behavior of the eldest son, but we're not going to go into that today. And what we see here, this younger son receives his portion, his inheritance. And we realize that back in that time, in that context, it was a land, it was cattle, it was sheep, it was, you know, you know, things. And to gather all your possessions and to go into a different country means you would have to sell everything. And, and the Bible says here that after not many days, after a short time, after a short while, you know, he sold his things quickly. To sell things quickly, you have to lower the price. You have to lower the value to sell things quickly, to liquidate everything. And what we see here is that these things that the father had worked upon for many years, these things which might have been to the family of great treasure, of great importance, of great value, this son sells them or discounts them, doesn't treasure them as he should, and he goes and sells them. He gets his money and he goes to a faraway country and he wastes all his possessions. And what Jesus Christ here is showing through this parable is that up to this point everything has been in control of that young man you know he's he can demand what he wants he can go where he wants he can do what he wants and then along comes something that is outside his control something that we realize from the scripture that God gives us bread and also he allows he gives harvest he allows famines and he's talking about this severe famine that arose, arises in the land. And we read about his wanted that no one can help him and how he goes. And for a Jewish man to, you know, to work with the swine was a disgrace, was an abomination, as it was an unclean animal. And not only that, you know, there were all these pods that he would have gladly ate that the swines were eating. And there were carob pods which were poisoned for a man. You know, the swines, pigs that could digest them, but a man couldn't eat them. So he was this, you know, young man doing something that was an abomination to him. And he can't even partake, can't even eat anything. And then all of a sudden, we see where, you know, where we from here, from our enlightened view, knowing the work of the Holy Spirit, how he came to himself, where this was the work of the Holy Spirit upon his life. And he says here, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And you see, this was... This was the passage that really struck my heart, that the, really, that the Holy Spirit impressed my heart. This was the passage that made me, to a certain degree, understand the love of God. Where here comes back this young man who had wasted all his father's possession. This young man who had spat in his father's face, in his father's face so to speak, by saying, I want you to die. Was saying, you know, I want what belongs to me. I can't wait for you to die. And after a scene that he goes and spends it all. And here comes this moment when he comes back to his father, comes back all ashamed. When he comes back, you know, with a burden of guilt upon himself. When the weight of sin is upon himself. And we see here the response of the father towards him. We see the reaction of the father when he sees his son coming back towards him. And the reaction is this, when the father sees the son, the father runs to him, falls on his neck, embraces him and kisses him. And then we read further on about, you know, the, the sandal that's, that gets given to him, that seal, that ring, you know, the best robe and the fatted calf that gets taken. But I'd like to draw our attention to the reaction of the father towards the son. You see, when, we, we, when we're talking about salvation... We have two, there are two paths to salvation. The first salvation is when we are born again, when we are reconciled to God, when we, be, when we are saved, when we become new creations in Jesus Christ. A heart that hates God, a heart that ignores God's righteousness, all of a sudden loves God, loves to read His Word, loves to fulfill God's will. 
the salvation of God in a person's life. But then there's the second step of salvation. When a person, when God leads a person into his kingdom, you know, when it's that end final result, when God saves us, when the Bible speaks about when we're resurrected from the dead, that's salvation. And what we see here is the son coming back to the father and the father accepting him. The father didn't condescend towards him. How often, you know, I've noticed it in my life that I do towards other people. I can't believe he did this and that and that, you know, and what he's coming back and he's expecting everything's supposed to be normal again. Well, according to Scripture, that's what God did. God reinstated him to the status of a son. What's really interesting here, you know, was that there was this moment in my life when, you know, I was struggling, and I shared a little bit with Sam about this, when I was struggling with a couple of sins in my life. It wasn't long ago. When there was a certain this situation in my church where it got me really down and now I see that it was God's providence and using it, you know, to teach me and to mold me and to fashion me more into his image. But all of a sudden, certain sins had, you know, had all of a sudden I can say flown to the surface, sins that I had not noticed that were in me. And these sins, you know, maybe for some people weren't terrible. Maybe people to these, for some people, these sins, you know, are lighthearted. They just, you know, they're not important to him. But for me, they were terrible. You know, and I was struggling because they were, I would almost say, they were like besetting sins. Because it was a sin, you know, I'd only ask forgiveness from God. I'd come to God in repentance. And the very next moment, I'd make the same mistake again. And I'd come again to God and I would ask for forgiveness, for cleansing and for strength to not do it again. And the very next moment, I'd do it again. And you know, after a while, you know, it's really interesting when Jesus Christ was speaking to Peter, he goes, um, when he prophesies about Peter's falling away, he says, you know, you know, I pray that your faith will not fail. And, you know, what I realize is that forgiveness and repentance, it's through faith. We receive that through faith in Jesus Christ. When we believe in the promises of God, we trust in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And here I was with these sins. And I had gotten to this stage in my life where I was ashamed to come to God. I felt as if God was disappointed with me. I felt, you know, as, you know, I felt as this prodigal son, as if he was speaking to me, where I was saying, I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. I'm ready to be, you know, the most lowest, whatever it be in your house, but I'm not even worthy anymore because I keep making the same dumb mistakes again. I keep doing it over and over again. And I'm so ashamed. And I'm so embarrassed. And I'm, you know, and, and sometimes it was just so hard to come to God. I don't know how to explain it when you don't find that faith. You don't find that strength to come to God and to trust in His sacrifice. And it was that very moment when God taught me through His scripture. The very moment when He drew my eyes to this passage. When He showed me the reaction of the Father towards His Son. And what I realized at that point, that God's favor towards me was not based on my performance. Did you realize that God's favor towards you is not based upon your deeds, upon your merit, upon your actions? God's favor to you today is based upon the atoning work of Jesus Christ. It's based upon today about, upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You know, when I was reading this passage, I realized that I was trusting in my own works. I was trusting that, you know, when things were going good with me, when I was praising God and praise God, God was giving me mercy to stand strong and preach and, you know, and be a witness and a testimony. That God was favoring me. God was putting his blessing upon me. But all of a sudden, because I had these certain areas in my life that needed to be cleaned up and fixed up and cleansed. That all of a sudden God had drawn away from me. That God had distanced himself. That he no longer wanted to do anything with me. And then I realized at that point, the Bible says that God demonstrated his love towards you and me. That Christ died for us while we were still sinners. While we were still alienated. You see, the Bible says that God's favor was shown towards you through Jesus Christ when you had nothing to do with God, when you wanted nothing to do with God, when you had no desire to serve God, when you were dead in your trespasses, dead in your sins, and you enjoyed that weakness that God abhorred. 
Because God is a holy God and He can have nothing to do with sin. And God poured out His favour upon you in the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Dear friends, and I realised at that point that we see here that God the Father, in spite of our sinfulness, we make mistakes every single day, in spite of our transgressions. Now, someone might say here, well, I don't actually sin that much. You know, what was really interesting, I preached a sermon a fair while ago that you know, really captivated me and understood the extent of my sinfulness. Where the Bible says, everything that you do not by faith is a sin. If you know something good that needs to be done, you don't do it, that is a sin. It talks about it in, the end of, in one of the, end of the chapters in James. And what I realized is that not only are there sins of commission that we do, but everything that we don't do is also a sin. Everything that God desires that is in His perfect will that needs to be fulfilled also is a sin. And that is why we read in the Bible that Christ is our righteousness. Not only do we have the atoning work of Christ in our life, which is the negative imputation, when Jesus Christ takes our sins upon Himself, we also have the positive imputation where Christ's righteousness, the complete fulfillment of the will of God, the complete fulfillment you know, of what God desired and demanded, that perfect life that we should live, where it's imputed upon us when we repent and we trust in the atoning work and the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what we see here is this Father... He didn't put that son down. That father, he didn't, you know, condemn him. You know, the father didn't lower him. But he sees here that the father had joy. And what I realized at that point is that when I come to Christ in forgiveness, when I come to Christ, you know, bearing, you know, even with my sin and my shame and my troubles, when I come in a repentant attitude, God has great joy in forgiving me. God has great joy in wiping the slate clean. God has great joy, you know, in, as the Bible says here, in bestowing His grace and His favor. You know, I'd like to read another place here, which was, you know, for me, just talk, talked about, you know, the grace of God, which is John chapter 17, verse 24. We realize that, this is the last prayer of Jesus Christ with the disciples. They've just had communion. He's just washed their feet. He's just broken the bread, you know, and they've shared in that communion. And he, he's offering that, you know, prayer, you know, f not only for his disciples, but for all those that would come after, all those that would believe in his name. And we read in chapter 17, verse 24, he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me be, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. And I'll leave it on there. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. What's really interesting is just before this, Jesus Christ has foretold, foretold the rejection of Peter. He's just for, you know, the disciples are all cocky. The disciples, you know, are all self-confident. They're saying, you know, even if everyone, you know, re rejects you, turns away from you, I will stand with you the whole time, you know. We will stand by you. We'll be there for you, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ tells them, and especially Peter, he says that you will all be scattered. He says to Peter, three times the rooster will crow and you will reject me. And what we see here, Jesus Christ is saying, he goes, yes, even Peter, because he's praying about Peter. He's also praying about you and me in this prayer. Yes, that Peter that's in the future going to reject me, that's going to step away from me. He's going to pretend, I don't know you, that he's going to say, I don't, know, I don't know this man. I've got nothing to do with him. I want him to be there where I am. This Peter who sometimes has a revelation from heaven that this is the Messiah, this is the Son of God. But the next moment, you know, he's saying, you know, you know, you know, don't go suffering. And Jesus Christ says, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. This very same Peter, God desires that he will be there where he is in heaven, in eternity to behold his glory. 
There's Peter, you know, and the disciples. They're sometimes so confident, you know, that they have this, you know, they've got, that God gives them the grace and they can heal people and miracles happen. But all of a sudden, they've got this pride and this arrogance. And they're saying, you know, we'll send fire down from here and we'll burn them. And the Bible and Jesus Christ said, you don't know what spirit you're talking about. And Jesus Christ saying, and yes, I want them to be there where I am. You see, the great desire of God, in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of the mistakes that we've made and we make today and we will make, God's desire is not only to save you, not only to save you so that you are born again, that you become a new creature, but God's desire and His will is, is to lead you into His kingdom where you will behold His glory forever. Where God can reveal to you Himself the true beauty, the true awe of who He is. That what Christ is truly saying that yes, that even though you're strong today, even though you know you you know going well today, and tomorrow you might be making mistakes, I want you to be there where I am. Do we fully understand this in the depths of our hearts? That the desire of Jesus Christ, the passion of Jesus Christ, is that He wants you to be there where He is, as the bridegroom that is waiting, you know, for that bride, the church. And Jesus Christ is saying that I want them to be there in spite of their failures, in spite of their flaws, in spite of their sinfulness. I see them as perfect through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Do we comprehend this in our hearts? That God has got such a great passion and desire for you to be saved. When I mean saved, when I mean saved is to be born again, to be made a new person, but also to be saved as in entering His kingdom. As Jeremiah says, you know, my intentions for you are for good, to give you hope and a future. That God's desire is to bring us to repentance, but also bring us into salvation, to bring us into His kingdom. You know, there's moments when we're on the Mount Transfiguration. Moments when God reveals His glory to us, when we're so strong and we're so happy. And there's moments in our lives when we're scattered like sheep and we don't know what to do. And there's moments when we understand what God wants to reveal to us. And there's moments when we completely misunderstand what God wants to see in our lives and what we, God wants, expects us to do. And sometimes we act in such a way that disappoints God. And we act in such a way, you know, that God, you know, is not according to God's will. But in spite of all this, Jesus says, I desire that you be there where I am to behold my glory. Dear friends, God's desire, His passion, His joy is to save you and to be with you. Oh, that you would be encouraged, that you would be strengthened. You know, when you understand that God's love is to give you a future and a hope. You know, often we preach about wrath and we preach about, you know, that He's an all-consuming fire, which is all true and needs to be preached. We preach about the justice and, the, and the, you know, the high standards, the holy law of God, which no man can set and no man can live up to. And that can only be met if we're only in Jesus Christ. But so often we forget that God's great desire, His passion, His joy is for you to be saved. His great desire and passion is that you would be there where He is. And that is why all these situations in your life, they happen for the good of those that are called according to His purpose. That's why you have all these troubles in your life. That's why you have all these situations in your life. That's why you have all these moments of despair in your life that God allows because He wants them to fashion you and to form you and to lead you into His kingdom. Amen. Dear friends, we're going to come to a time of prayer now. The two things that I wanted to... Three things I wanted to accentuate today is that God is a God that rejoices, rejoices over you. He rejoices over me. I know sometimes it's hard to believe when you realize you're a child of hell, when you realize you deserve the complete wrath of God, when you, deli when you realize you deserve to spend an eternity there and receive nothing less. And you realize you're receiving grace. You've been pardoned. You've been forgiven. But not only have you been forgiven, you've been cleansed. You've been sanctified. You've been born again. You've been regenerated by the Spirit of God. The second is that God's attitude towards you is not based on your performance. I'm not talking about which is giving our license to sin, where it's talking about a freedom to do what we want, not caring about what God wants. 
But it's talking about that in spite of our failures, in spite of the mistakes we make and the sins that we so often stumble upon, God's favour towards us has not changed. His desire is just as strong to lead you into his kingdom. His desire is just as powerful as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ was praying that prayer to his Father. He still wants to lead you into that kingdom. I hope you guys have been all encouraged, as I've been encouraged. And, you know, it's, it, this sermon had such a profound impact on my life that, you know, I can't get on my knees and pray and not pray and not mention that. When you fully understand the depth of love and the depth of favour that God shows towards us in spite of who we truly are now, depravity, it's something to rejoice about. It's something to be encouraged about. It's something to be comforted. It's something to hold on to. It's something that we have to preach about, something that we have to encourage each other with. So the three things that I'd like us to remember is, first thing, God is a rejoicing God over you and me. The second thing is that God's attitude towards us does not change based on our performance because God's attitude towards us is through Jesus Christ. And the third thing is, is that God's desire is for you to be saved. If you're not saved in the context that you're not born again, if you haven't repented and put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you haven't accepted the atoning work and the life and the righteousness that Jesus Christ accomplished here on earth, you know, Christ is calling. But also in the fact that God wants to lead us into His kingdom, that He will guide us, He'll teach us. And these situations that happen so often in our life, and sometimes we have disputes and discords in our life and we have arguments and they fashion us and they mold us and they lead us not in the fact that we're worthy to make us more christ-like so let's come to a time of prayer